Greetings, happy warriors, and welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, remain diligently devoted to revealing how the world really works. And perhaps no better place to start than is by recalling COVID. Everybody remembers COVID. But what you may not know is that many are even eager to relive it. Various self-anointed experts are pushing for wearing of masks. CNN recently reported that experts associated with the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, are urging people to use not just regular masks, but N95 masks, and to be instructed formally in how to use them properly. And this is now late summer 2023. Rutgers University, a big university in New Jersey, an important school. Rutgers, along with about 100 schools, are requiring students who are starting the new semester now to be vaccinated and to get updated boosters and to wear masks inside the school. Now, I have to ask you a simple question. Is this, do you believe, because of a resurgence of the biological virus The disease of COVID is returning. Do you believe that that's what's causing this? Or do you think that there is a spiritual, mental, psychological virus that is spreading from person to person around the culture and getting ordinary people to start working themselves up again about COVID and to return to those ghastly, nightmarish days of people wearing masks and being rude to anyone who wasn't wearing a mask. Look, mental, spiritual, psychological viruses do exist, and they do spread, and they cause very real consequences. Just ask a man called Gerald Amaralt in Malden, Massachusetts, who during the 80s fell victim to this insanity. It was a virus that spread through the country in the mid-80s and into the early 90s that children uh, could be believed as they told stories of the most incredible abuses inflicted upon them by preschool, in preschool by preschool carers, um, teachers dressed in clown suits, undressing them, magic wands, swords, all taking place in dungeons and cellars, which didn't exist in the school. And uh, some of the famous occurrences were the McMartin Preschool in California. There was, as I say, the case in Malden, Massachusetts. Gerald sat in jail for many, many, many years, in spite of the fact that it's obvious and clear to everybody that nothing happened. Wenatchee, Washington. And uh, the idea is that these childhood repressed memories can be recovered by judicious questioning by psychologists and therapists, And on that basis, um, people's lives were destroyed. Now, I will tell you that as a blanket rule in biblical perspective, children may not give evidence. No children's evidence is admissible in a court of law, as indeed it should not be. And there is hardly a better contemporary proof for that than the virus. Yes, the virus of um, preschool uh, abuse that circulated around America and also England during the 80s and 90s. Now, you know, what was behind it? What was going on? 
I think that something was, uh, some of it had to do with the fact that women were starting to enter the workforce in large numbers, and women were starting to be told how much more important it was for them to show up at work as a grocery store checker out or as a warehouse supervisor or as anything else and uh, put their children in daycare. There was a lot of uh, worry. Parents were anguished by this, and uh, but nonetheless, they were told that this is what you're supposed to do, and so mothers did it. And I think that there was probably uh, a readiness to believe the worst of these preschool settings um, that they themselves elected to send their children to. I think that was part of it. Uh, the other part of it, of course, is aggressive prosecutors with no restraint and no control um, who see the opportunity for ca- for career-building prosecutions that will get into the newspapers and be sensational. Well, of course, that's exactly what happened here. And uh, particularly the prosecutor in Massachusetts um, was was quite amazing in, in his vindictiveness, uh, trying to, to do everything to make the Amaralts agree and uh, confess to their terrible crimes, which they never, ever agreed and accepted to do in, in spite of admonishments and offers. Uh, it, was, it was a dark, dark period in American justice. It was a bad time. But it swept the country. It was a spiritual virus that swept the country. Um, For those of you who are interested, by the way, I will tell you that um, uh, Dorothy Rabinowitz, uh, who was a writer for the Wall Street Journal and did a series in the Wall Street Journal on this, uh, she did a book. She did a book on... uh, this terrible period of, of people's lives being destroyed in this fashion. And um, she called it, and I should have clarified this in advance. Um, so I can, it's called No Crueler Tyrannies, False Accusation, False Witness, and Other Terrors of Our Time. And uh, I'm going to reread it over this weekend. Um, because I want to refresh my memory because I think that in the United States of America, those times are returning. And I think that possibly the way that the accused of the so-called insurrection of January the 6th, um, I think that they are being uh, treated and prosecuted in also cruel, unusual, and totally unjust ways. So Dorothy Rabinowitz's book is called No Crueler Tyrannies, Accusation, False Witness, and Other Terrors of Our Time. And uh, as always, I'm not saying, oh, you must read this, but if if this is something that interests you, then you certainly uh, would want to get the material from source right there in Dorothy Rabinowitz's book, I think. And before I go on to the next uh, example, let me take this opportunity of beseeching you to please subscribe uh, on whatever platform you're listening to the show. Please go ahead and subscribe. It's something I didn't really understand fully um, until recently, but uh, the number of subscribers is a very important metric for a show like ours. And so at uh, no cost to yourself and benefit to us, It would be great if you'd go ahead and do whatever you have to do on your platform to subscribe to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. That would be great. And also, uh, I want to let you know that one of our very valuable resources, it's called the Financial Prosperity Collection, and it's um, uh, 10 hours of video instruction on increasing your revenue. Now, you know, you know that uh, there are some wonderful resources to reduce your debt and finally become debt-free, and I recommend Dave Ramsey. Um, there are wonderful resources to learn how to effectively invest your money. But this particular resource, the Financial Prosperity Collection, on our website is to increase your revenue. Now, Uh, Everybody knows we're living in a time of inflation. 
the United States government is admitting a level of inflation which, in my view, is approximately half of the realistic view. Uh, The Office of Management and Budget and the White House and the government in general are very, very good at massaging figures. They're very, very good at uh, putting out propaganda, and they're very, very good at distorting things so that you will hear what you are intended to hear. And so the figures that are officially given for inflation, you know, you don't have to listen to me on this. Just go to the store and or do some research. See what a gallon of diesel cost a year ago and see what it costs now. Um, go to the grocery store and check on what the how the size of various food containers that you purchase has shrunk. So you get less for your money or how the price has gone up or both and use those as metrics to discover that the actual inflation rate, probably um, above 12%, how far above 12%, I'm not absolutely sure, but I am sure it's above 12%. And so why, why am I telling you this? What this means is that you need to increase your revenue, right? That's what you have to do. That's the only way to deal with inflation. I don't know how to deal with inflation other than that. I mean, we're going to try and cut your expenses. You probably are not uh, outrageously spendthrift to begin with. You're probably reasonably frugal to begin with. And so there's a limit. I mean, are you really able to reduce your living expenses by 13%? I don't think so. You know, look, in an emergency, everything's possible. But, you know, without making yourself unhappy about this, I think that would be very, very difficult. I don't think it would be easy to reduce your living expenses by 13%. Rather than that, increase your revenue by 13%. Um, Increase the revenue in your business. Start a business. Learn how to get a raise, an increase in your salary. All of these things are aspects of increasing your revenue that I cover in the Financial Prosperity Collection. So you go to the website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and uh, you look for the online resources. The Financial Prosperity Collection is a very important one and a very popular one, extremely popular, uh, for precisely this reason. And it is the most effective way of dealing with inflation is to increase your revenue, increase the amount of money you bring into your bank account every month. And if you can increase your revenue by 13 or 14%, and yes, you can, then inflation becomes relatively painless. Then you've, you've, you've caught up, you've made up. Now, if you are working for a job where there are automatic pay increases, uh, you know, that's, that's terrific. But not everybody has that. And so some people have to get a second side gig. Some people have to uh, increase the revenue in the small business they're operating already. Uh, People have to get a second job. But there are all kinds of different ways to use your time most effectively for the purpose of increasing your revenue. So go ahead to the website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and... uh, Look into the Financial Prosperity Collection. I don't believe that you will regret that. So um, talking about spiritual viruses, okay? We all know what a biological virus is. We, We went through that with COVID. But spiritual viruses are more subtle but just as contagious and just as dangerous when they do strike. Um, Another example is that in 1942, the, uh, and again, 1942, you've got to remember that the army, the German Wehrmacht, has taken a terrible beating already in the winter of 41 and 42, uh, where on the Eastern Front, the siege of Stalingrad and the arrival of the Russian winter, and uh, the, the Wehrmacht has lost uh, perhaps 2 million men between Uh, deaths and debilitation. I mean, the debilitation was so severe 
that uh, men came back to Germany from the Eastern Front. And Hitler's main concern was to prevent demoralization of the citizens of the Third Reich because they didn't want them to see these soldiers. These soldiers came back. Many of them came back, and and this is just horrifying to even imagine, but their eyelids were frozen off because see any bodily extremity, fingers, toes, um, eyelids, and also male organs uh, get literally destroyed by the cold that these poor men suffered at uh, the siege of Stalingrad. So um, you've got a shortage of German soldiers, but meanwhile, one of the prime tasks of the Nazi party was the elimination of Jews. The uh, roundup and uh, placing in concentration camps and the methodical massacring of uh, millions of Jews, that, above all, had to continue. And so uh, the uh, Nazi party rounded up a battalion. This was the first they tried. It was called Reserve Police Battalion 101 of the German Order Police. And what they did is they took ordinary middle-aged German men who would not be able to serve in the regular Wehrmacht. They've aged out of that. And they put them in this reserve police battalion number 101, and they made them responsible for mass shootings and roundups of Jewish people and deportation to the death camps in Poland. And Again, this is an amazing story because these were ordinary guys. Two years earlier, these guys, three years earlier, these guys had been mailmen and uh, and uh, workers and, and um, you know, they're just ordinary guys. And they are brought and formed into this police battalion. And even though, and there's a book called Ordinary Men, And in Ordinary Men, they describe how, as this battalion was formed, they went off to do their first roundup of Jews. And um, the commander said to the men, look, if some of you are squeamish about this, you can, you don't have, you can stay, sit out this one, and the rest of us are going to go in and uh, collect these enemies of the Reich and uh, kill them. And very few men opted out. Some did, but only the first time. The next time they went on with it. And... This is just an extraordinary thing. How do you get ordinary middle-class guys who, you know, three years ago were sitting around playing dots in a pub in a, in a beer cellar somewhere in Germany and doing their jobs or whatever their day-to-day jobs were, and today you're able to get them to point a gun at the head of another human being for no reason at all and shoot them on the command of an officer. This is amazing stuff. The susceptibility of people to authority is part of this virus. And, uh, you know, back going back to the 80s, again, the time of the uh, preschool uh, prosecutions, there was a slogan that university students used to uh, proudly proclaim. They put it on their bumper stickers and on their jackets and on their caps, question authority. Some, you know, some of, if some of you lived through that period, you'll remember. The phrase question authority was a big phrase. Every, it was out there. You know, young people heralded their youth and their freshness and their vitality and their Um, uh, rebelliousness by question authority. That's, you know, not that long ago, 35 years ago. How long is that? You know, just a little more than a generation has gone by. And now the position of university students is accept authority. And so whether it's masks and uh, and, uh, vaccinations and whether it is... um, speech codes and political correctness, the imposition of authoritarian rule on America's university campuses is quite extraordinary. Again, a spiritual virus. When the person or the people you associate with become infected, they infect you too. All of us are. And so I want to give you perhaps the very best example of uh, contemporary 
spiritual virus that is every bit as impactful as the spiritual virus that made people decide that little children spinning fantastic yarns about their teachers dressing up and coming in on horses, these little children could be believed. And uh, the spiritual virus that made ordinary men in Nazi Germany become murderers and the, um, the, the, the spiritual virus that uh, makes university students behave the way they do. Well, here's a really good example, something we have going on right now. Have you noticed that the general culture in the United States of America is a culture of shortage? Now, I wrote about this recently. Uh, I remember not that long ago having the pleasure of taking a shower in a hotel in Dubai. Now, there, there were two notable things about my shower in my hotel room in Dubai. Dubai, number one was the, the shower, the bathroom had a big picture window. And, uh, you know, we were on like, I don't know, the 40th floor or something. And it looked out over the desert. And so the view from the window is a dry, dusty, waterless, arid desert. At the same time, I'm standing under what felt like Niagara Falls, except it was warm water. There was so much water cascading over me. It was not only pouring at me from the top, it was shooting at me from six different nozzles in the wall of the shower. And they were governed by separate faucets and separate temperature gauges. I got to tell you, I had to tear myself away from this sybaritic delight. I enjoyed that. It was ridiculous. I felt so decadent. You know why? Because in the United States of America, whether you go and take a shower in a hotel room in Motel 6 or Holiday Inn or Ritz-Carlton Resorts or a Hyatt Regency, it makes no difference. You will stand under a shower that trickles a pathetic little drizzle of water. Really pathetic. And it, it's coming out of a water flow restricted shower head. Why? Because we're short of water. We're short of oil. Everybody knows that, right? We're, we're running out of oil. We're even running out of space because you'll hear people panicking. There are too many human beings. The population is too big. They say that except when it comes to discussions about immigration. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, tens of thousands of immigrants pouring across America's southern border every month. And there's plenty of space, apparently. But otherwise, we have to really reduce the number of people because there's no space. Um, have you ever tried to get your purchases packaged in a plastic or paper bag at your local supermarket when you go shopping, good luck to you, because in many cities around the United States, they won't do that. Therefore, all intents and purposes, there's a shortage of paper bags. There's a shortage of plastic bags. Trees, big shortage of trees. How about building, would you like to build yourself a man cave in your yard how about a nice little 20 foot by 12 foot shed? And, um, you know, you insulate it. You can sit in there when, when life gets a bit much. Maybe, maybe you can smoke a cigar there, which you can't do in your home out of consideration for your family. Go along and buy some lumber to build your shed. You know where your lumber comes from? It's imported. Why? Well, it's apparently there's a shortage of trees. How do you explain this? Water, short, right? We're short of water. Many, many uh, cities around the country have literal water shortages. You're, you're prohibited from washing your car or watering your lawn. They're short of water, really. Electricity, have you noticed? We're short of electricity. Uh, right now, Summer 2023, California sends out emergency energy alerts on people's phones saying to people, hey, turn up your air conditioning. Don't put your electric car on a charger. 
cut down on your usage of electricity. Otherwise, we're going to have to have some blackouts and you'll get no electricity at all. Okay, now I select as an example of American ability the year 1944, the last complete war year of World War II. Now, remember, it was only at the end of 41 that America found itself in a war. Up till that time, the popular mood in America was we're not getting involved in this European war. The isolationist policies were very, very real, so much so that during their secret conversations, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill in England um, discussed the fact that bringing America into the war just wasn't possible because the popular mood was no war. And so there was no um, preparing armaments or uh, getting troops ready. There was nothing like that going on. And so beginning of 1942, America finds itself at war with Japan and Germany because Germany was quick to declare war on, on America, a weird, strange policy of, of Germany's. And, uh, and now, with no preparation, 1942, 1943, America's got to fight wars. We don't have the ships. We certainly don't have the airplanes. But by 1944, do you know how many airplanes were hurled into combat from the factories of America? The number is so big that I'm going to have to sort of explain it to you. 96,000 airplanes from agile lethal fighters to gigantic four-engine bombers, 96,000 airplanes. That's what happened when America got itself in, ready for war. Now, 96,000 airplanes just in the year 1944, that means 11 complete airplanes sent into battle every single hour of every single day of every week, of every month, of the entire year, 11 airplanes per hour are completed and sent to battle. Imagine what that took. All of a sudden, enough aluminum had to be produced and processed and factories had to be set up and assembly lines and men had to be trained and women and designs had to be designed. Engines had to be produced I mean, think what it takes to produce an airplane. And now think what it takes to produce 96,000 of them. I tell you all this because it was a time when America was able to solve problems. There was a very big problem. The problem was called Japan and the other problem was called Germany. And the problem was the need for airplanes. By the way, I could tell you a similar story about ships. The rapidity with which the United States was able to start producing tons of shipping. In, you know, in a way that they'd never done before. My point is that uh, don't you think that with even just a fraction of that level of ingenuity, America could solve the problem of being short of water, could solve the problem of being short of electricity, could solve the problem of being short of oil, could solve the problem of being short of trees. Every, easy to solve with that level of determination and grit and can-do attitude could be done, right? Why isn't it done, right? Why is America willing to move ever closer to the dark image of a third, a primitive third world country? Electricity shortages, water shortages, oil shortages, energy shortages. Why? And I want to give you the, the explanation for that, which I, I think is uh, helpful because in terms of your ability to increase your revenue, it will be extremely helpful to change your spiritual virus, to get rid of the wrong spiritual virus. What do I mean by the wrong spiritual virus? Well, let me first of all speak to you just for a moment as a... Um, believing Jew, Bible-believing, God-fearing Jew. You know, not a particularly good one, but I'm trying. My faith and, and that of Bible-believing Christian brethren, 
Jews and Christians all believe in a God of incredible abundance. It stands to sense, right? God is limitless by definition, and if God is limitless, then he's a God of abundance, and there's not a problem. He, he's got as, he can give you as much of anything as he wishes because there are no limits. And so I live in a world created by a God of abundance, and therefore I do not see limits. I do not see limits in what I can or should be earning. I do not see limits in what can or should be the size of my family. I don't see limits in anything at all, right? I mean, I may decide there may be some areas of limits, but I don't see externally imposed limits because I'm a child of a loving and abundant God. I believe that with every microscopic morsel of my being. And so for that reason, Whenever I experience evidence of abundance, I get a palpable thrill running through me. I get an almost irrepressible surge of sheer joy. Let me tell you what I mean. Um, I uh, spoke in Lancaster, Pennsylvania a week ago, and uh, Susan and I um, spent the night in that area. It's Amish country, and and we have many friends in that community. And uh, we also had the opportunity to stop at a few Amish farms and to stop at Amish country stores. And I've got to tell you, for me, it's a religious experience. I walk into one of these stores and it is literally packed to the rafters with the most beautiful, delicious-looking produce. They're giant watermelons. They're cherries. They're tomatoes. They're cucumbers. There's apples and peaches of every variety, and there's huge amounts of them. If I wanted to feed a huge group of people, I could do that just by purchasing what I need from one of these Amish country stores. There is so much there, it is a religious delight. I just absolutely love it. I enjoy it because that abundance is a validation of my understanding of the world that my God put us in. It's beautiful. And when we drive along fields and we watch, I mean, acre after acre after acre, um, growing, healthy, vibrant, wonderful-looking produce. And we go past herds of dairy cows, lots of cows filling the fields. And we see a farm that's, that's filled with chickens producing eggs. I, I love it I, I, because this is visual evidence of a world of abundance. Now, look, I mean, I know what uh, some people are going to be saying as they, there's always somebody in every crowd, right? I know what some people are going to be saying to my little uh, tribute to abundance. Well, there's a lot of people in the world going hungry. That may well be true. I don't have direct evidence of that. I know there are a lot of organizations raising money to feed the hungry of the world, but um having traveled pretty extensively throughout Africa, which is usually the place pointed out as to where people are starving in hunger, whenever I have encountered hunger in Africa, it's not for lack of divine abundance. It's usually a result of human interference. When Russia suffered dreadful famines, everybody knows the truth is that food was rotting in the fields on the farms. Stalin had killed out several million kulaks who were, you know, Russian small business people who took their wagons to the farms and bought the produce from the farmers and carried it to the marketplace in the village or the town where they sold it to the housewives. And they made some money on that. Uh, Stalin hated that entire group of people, the businessmen, because he saw them as profiteering. He saw them as just adding to the price of food. There shouldn't be anybody between the farmer and the housewife. 
Well, the result of killing the kulaks was starvation and hunger. And whenever I have seen hunger in Africa, uh, be it in Somalia or the Sudan or many, many other countries, it has always been the result of government interference, government oppression, and even outright corruption on the part of, uh, of government and its administering of the marketplace. So, um, so that's why I say please allow me to continue the fact, my little song of praise, uh, to the fact that uh, abundance validates for me the picture of an abundant God. And I enjoy that. It's such an important thing that once a week, we Jews are instructed and we do practice abundance. You know, there's no rule about having to eat. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, and thou shalt eat three solid meals a day. Because the Bible doesn't tell us to do things we're probably going to do any old how. But the only day on which there is a requirement to eat, and not only just to eat, but to eat more than on any other day, well, that's the Shabbat, that's the Sabbath. And uh, whereas on an ordinary dinner, you might well see a loaf of bread, and uh, we'd cut the bread, and we'd make a blessing on it, and we'd eat it with some delicious Amish butter. Yes, yes, there is a difference. There is a difference between regular butter from the market and the butter we acquired uh, from our Amish friends. Um, And uh, you might well do that. But on the Sabbath, on Shabbat, we don't have one loaf of bread on the table. We have two loaves of bread on the table, more than we're likely to be able to to eat even, because we want to surround ourselves with abundance, because abundance is a religious experience. Abundance validates for us our relationship with our God. I I hope you're able to sort of see how I feel about that. Well, once I've explained that, let me now talk about the new state religion in America. This is the religion I call secular fundamentalism. It is that uh, it is the official government religion designed to do everything to destroy everything that the Bible attempts to build, most notably marriage and family. A traditional biblical family is the enemy, and this is one of the main reasons that the government has been pushing and the culture as a uh, a, a part of the population that has caught the virus also works on trying to get women out of the demeaning empty, pointless life of building a family, putting the kids in daycare and getting out to the thrilling, meaningful, wonderful world of the factory floor or the office. That's the spirit. But what it does do, of course, is makes it much harder for families to thrive because without a mom, without a wife, families just stagger along helplessly, without a rudder, without a guide, in an attempt to continue to function. Meanwhile, in the world of secular fundamentalism, which has as its focus the elimination of any relationship with God, if God is the symbol of abundance, or if abundance is the symbol of God, Well, then obviously, the symbol of secularism is, think about it, yes, you got it, is exactly, that's right, it is shortage. And in exactly the same way that I thrill to the sight of abundance, I love going to county fairs. I love 4-H. I enjoy those things because you come there and you see herds of fat cows and you see uh, displays, grange displays. I love going to these fairs because farmers bring in their produce and you get to see what they're growing and what's there. It's thrilling. It's abundant. It's a religious nirvana for me. And in exactly the same way, if I was a secularist, why then, obviously, I would thrill 
to shortage. In exactly the way I find abundance affirming my faith, so it is that secular fundamentalists see shortage as affirming their faith. That's right, they do. That's exactly the point. And so could the United States of America solve the water shortage? Of course. Could they solve the electrical shortage? Of course. Could they solve the energy and oil shortage? Yeah. Could they solve the wood shortage? Of course. They don't want to because it would violate their subconscious spiritual theology. Shortage validates their deep commitment to secularism. Shortage for them is as wonderful as abundance is to me. That is the point of today's Rabbi Daniel Lappin show. And so I urge you, this is one of the reasons that I don't just speak of finance and family and friendship and fitness. I speak of finance and friendship and family and fitness and faith. Because abundance is a function of faith. Secularism brings shortage. Whether it's secularism in Cuba or the Soviet Union, secularism always brings faith. What about China, you ask? I've spoken about that in the past, and I will again in the future. But it's not an accident that there are more fervent Christians in China then there are members of the Chinese Communist Party. What is more, it is not an accident that in some weird way, China is not stamping out Christianity. They are trying to stamp out Islam. There's no question about that. But they're not trying to stamp out Christianity. Do you know why? Because they know what you know and what I know. And that is Judeo-Christian Bible-based faith is the faith that produces abundance, abundance in every way, abundant family and abundant finances and abundant farms and growth and produce. Yes, there is a very strong connection. And so I urge you all, each and every one of you happy warriors, do your best to eliminate the culture of shortage. Um, I mean, I hate the whole recycling uh, religion. I hate it because I know that it has no economic value. I know that most cities, although they go for the separate collection, the recycler truck comes around and the garbage truck comes around, they all get put in exactly the same place afterwards. Don't trust me. Trust the New York Times on that. Yes, of all places, the New York Times ran a story of how uh, most major cities just toss all the recycling and the garbage together. It is far too expensive and pointless to try and extract uh, the occasional aluminum can and far less expensive to produce aluminum from scratch. There is not a shortage. I love using plastic uh, tableware if it means that it saves my wife some time. I love anything that uses the resources of this abundant world in order to gain more time in this world. That is the important point. And so each of you happy warriors, you've got to work hard to try and get rid of the virus of shortage in your life. Believe me, we are all susceptible to propaganda. We are all susceptible to indoctrination. You don't believe me? Talk to the advertising industry. Think about that. The billions of dollars that rational, thoughtful, profit-minded companies spend on advertising, they wouldn't do. It would be a complete waste if you and I were not in any way at all impacted by advertising. Yes, we are. We are impacted by advertising and we are impacted by the spiritual messages beamed at us by the culture. And of all the messages beamed to us by the culture, one of the most insidious and dangerous, one of the most contagious, so easy to spread and so destructive and so dangerous and damaging is the virus of shortage. Work on getting that totally out of your soul. And there are 
practical things you can do. Try and get it out of your soul. Try and embrace the idea of abundance. There's plenty out there. There really is. Now, you yourself may be feeling you don't have plenty, but to some extent that is because you have been infected by the virus of shortage. And uh, yes, there are vaccines for it. As you can think about everything I've spoken about today, and it will all become even clearer than it should be already now. And so, dear happy warriors, I wish you a week of incredible growth and incredible abundance as you get rid of the spiritual mindset, the spiritual schematic, the horrible virus of shortage, and build up your family and your finance, your friendships, your fitness, and yes, your faith. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.